Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, the, the way you're seated tonight, I guess you're symbolically diverse, and, and I hope you're also politically and diverse in every other way. Uh, this ought to be an interesting lecture tonight. Tonight's lecture, of course, is the third for this first semester, the last this semester. Boy, it went quickly. Um, and as usual, we want to make sure that we thank the English Bonner Mitchell Foundation. As you know, uh, the foundation has been incredibly loyal to us. Once again, mention our media sponsors, who have also been very loyal, Wayne TV, News Channel 15, and Northeast Indiana Public Radio. Uh, the the co-sponsor of tonight's lecture is the AIDS Task Force, and, and we're proud to be associated with them as well. This year, they're celebrating 25 years of service to Northeast Indiana, and I think it's worth thanking them for that. I would also like to recognize their executive director, Greg Manifold. He's here. Greg, wherever you are, would you please? There he is. being unobtrusive halfway to the back. You know, Greg? Um, after the lecture tonight, as usual, there will be a question and answer session. Uh, we have two microphones set up for you. Please use them. Uh, your, your voices just don't carry, and it's very hard for the rest of the audience to understand your question and the answers without the questions. I got, wasn't it Johnny Carson who did the answer man thing? It, it doesn't work very well with our, uh, our speakers. So if you could step up to the microphones, that would, be, that would be a great help. After the lecture, Mr. Sullivan will be available to sign books. Uh, that'll be out in the lobby, and we invite you to, oh, we always invite you to buy books, but so does he, and, uh, and we'll, He'll be glad to do that. He's incredibly personable. We, we've had a lovely time with him all day. Did a great job with students. Uh, my notes here also have a few words about him, but he's going to be introduced probably in painful detail by Christopher Bradley, so I'm going to leave that to Christopher. So let me introduce Christopher Bradley, an assistant professor in our sociology department, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you, Chancellor. It is my privilege tonight to introduce Andrew Sullivan, a senior editor and blogger at The Atlantic Online and a regular columnist for the Sunday Times of London. Andrew is a self-described libertarian conservative whose opinions on gay marriage, the war in Iraq, and the erosion of civil liberties in the United States has helped to define him as one of the most provocative political and social commentators today. In his latest book, The Conservative Soul, how we lost it, how to get it back, Andrew points out that the Republican far right has hijacked the conservative movement in America and that the only way to combat this is for Republicans to return to a conservative tradition that is based on practical restraint, individual freedom, constitutional norms, and skepticism. A prolific author whose work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Esquire, and Salon.com, Andrew was one of the first political journalists to move his writings and thoughts to the blogosphere. His weblog, which is entitled The Daily Dish, won the 2008 Weblog Award for Best Blog and is ranked by Playboy magazine as number one on its list of top 10 political blogs in America. Andrew is also known for being a pioneering voice on such issues as same-sex marriage and allowing gays to openly serve in the military. His 1993 essay, The Politics of Homosexuality, was credited by The Nation magazine as being one of the most influential articles that advocated for the advancement of gay rights. His follow-up to this essay was his 1995 book, Virtually Normal, an argument about homosexuality, which is widely considered to be one of the most definitive books on the issue of equal rights for homosexuals. Andrew has spoken at numerous universities and colleges, including Harvard, Yale, Boston College, Notre Dame, the University of Texas at Austin, and Oxford University. He has been a guest on over 100 radio shows across the United States, as well as on numerous television shows such as Nightline, Face the Nation, 
Meet the Press, Hardball, The O'Reilly Factor, The Larry King Show, and Real Time with Bill Maher. In fact, I first became aware of Andrew by watching him on the HBO show Real Time with Bill Maher. Andrew is a frequent guest on the show, and I must admit that although I don't always agree with everything he says when he's on that show, he does make me think. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Andrew Sullivan. Hi. Thanks for having me here. What a big stadium. They don't tell you until you get out here how huge it is. Um, anyway, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm particularly delighted to be asked to speak about a topic that is pretty dear to my heart and that, uh, that our culture actually doesn't really take too seriously. And it's a simple subject and one that we're all familiar with. It's an experience that almost every human being has. And yet it's an experience that we rarely talk about, rarely celebrate, rarely analyze as a phenomenon, as an experience, as part of, and a deep part, a central part of human life. I'm talking about something as simple as friendship. What is it? Why is it so important? Why do we actually in our culture really not talk about it or think about it very much? When you look back to the ancient world, friendship was the critical virtue for the ancient Greeks and the Romans. Here's Aristotle on it. I thought I'd give you some Aristotle just to, just to whet the appetite. He said, wrote, for friendship is some sort of excellence or virtue or involves virtue and it is moreover indispensable for life. No one would choose to live without friends even if he had all other goods. Rich men and those who hold office and power are above all others regarded as requiring friends. For what good would their prosperity do them? if it didn't provide them with the opportunity for good works. And the best works done, and those which deserve the highest praise, are those that are done to one's friends. When people are friends, they have no need of justice. But when they are just, they need friendship in addition. In fact, the just, in the fullest sense, is regarded as constituting an element of friendship. So Aristotle put friendship as a virtue superior even to justice. It was one of the highest goals of any human being, even if you became the wealthiest and most powerful human being on the planet. If you had no friends, it was pointless. You had no one to share it with. You were alone. And the one thing we know about human beings is that we don't want to be alone. The Romans grasped this too. Here's Cicero. I told you you'd get educated tonight, but anyway, Cicero, De Amicitia. For friendship is nothing else than an accord in all things human and divine conjoined with mutual goodwill and affection. And I am inclined to think that with the exception of wisdom, no better thing has been given to man by the immortal gods. Now that's quite a statement. With the exception of wisdom, no better thing has been given to man by the immortal gods. Some prefer riches, some good health, some power, some public honors, and many even prefer sensual pleasures. The last is the highest aim of brutes. The others are fleeting and unstable things and dependent less upon human foresight than upon the fickleness of fortune. Therefore, among men like those just mentioned, friendship offers advantages almost beyond my power to describe. Again, isn't it striking how, how great the value is placed on this particular relationship between two human beings? Again, 
the centrality of friendship. Not love, not family, not romance, not community, but friendship is striking. How did we lose this understanding? How did this thing which was so central to both ancient and medieval life disappear in the modern world or become something that we take for granted? We don't really talk about very much. Well, one thing is it's been dismissed, I think, fundamentally as inferior to romantic love. Romantic love is, of course, intoxicating and wonderful and beautiful. And romantic love is also geared in our culture and our society towards the inevitable fruition of marriage and family. And Christianity and Judeo-Christian ideas have emphasized this consistently. And they're absolutely right to. There is something unique and wonderful about romantic love, its expression in sexuality, and its expression in marriage and family. The family remains and has to be a, a core institution of our culture. And yet, marriage to really succeed, to last, to really be a long and enduring relationship requires, does it not, friendship above everything to keep it alive. Yes, romance and sexual attraction brings people together. But ask any married couple here tonight whether years later sex is the thing that keeps them together and they would probably look away or note that other things have taken its place. And when you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. Love, after all, and according to many philosophers and thinkers and writers through the ages, is terribly inferior to friendship. And the differences are quite stark. Love, for example, is something you fall into. Falling in love is a great, involuntary, overwhelming, wonderful sensation. We're all obsessed with it in a way. Every movie we watch tends to have a little love story in it. We all want the end of every complicated plot to end up with person A marrying person B and living happily ever after. Every Shakespearean comedy ends with everybody romantically managing to find their mate. But Shakespeare, even in the greatest work probably ever written about romantic love, Romeo and Juliet, also implies that we shouldn't get too carried away by it. Romeo and Juliet in many ways should be, and might have been, called Romeo and Rosaline. Why? Because if you actually remember the play, you realize that Romeo, in the very beginning, before he's met Juliet, is completely nuts about Rosaline. He is just as crazy and in love and desperate for the company of Rosaline as he will ever be for Juliet. And yet the minute Juliet walks in, boom, Rosaline is history. Love is like that. It seizes you quickly, and you drop it quickly. When I say love, I mean romantic love, that erotic charge, that excitement, that limerence of meeting your soulmate, which is fused together with sexual attraction and passion. But as Shakespeare noted, it can happen very quickly. How much is it really worth if it can be turned on like that? What does love at first sight mean? Isn't it actually a delusion? How do we know what lies beneath? How does it last? Montaigne, the great 16th century essayist, in 
probably the greatest ever essay written about friendship, De l'Amitié, argued quite passionately and I think quite persuasively that friendship is much superior to the love of Romeo for Juliet. In fact, he described the love of Romeo for Juliet as an attempt to form a friendship inspired by beauty. And in perhaps the perfect literary expression of the difference between love and friendship, Montaigne wrote that the ardor of Eros is undoubtedly, quote, more active, more scorching, and more intense. But it's an impetuous and fickle flame, undulating and variable, a fever flame, subject to fits and lulls that holds us only in one corner. In friendship, it is a general and universal warmth, all gentleness and smoothness, with nothing bitter and stinging about it. Thus, these two passions within me came to be known to each other, but to be compared, never. The first, friendship, keeping its course in proud and lofty flight and disdainfully watching the other, love, make its way far, far beneath it. Kind of radical words in our culture, somewhat subversive words in our culture. And notice that Montaigne is not denying the value of marriage. He himself was married. And the essay was written in memory and commemoration of his closest friend when he was growing up and in his uh, early adulthood, who was tragically died. So Montaigne argues that romantic love is kind of involuntary, almost a spasm, whereas friendship is based upon knowledge of the other person acquaintance with them, it requires tending like a garden, and it is more durable and more real. You can't suddenly fall into friendship with somebody. It develops as you get to know them, as you realize you have a lot in common. If the romantic love partnership is two people facing one another, gazing into each other's eyes, drooling a little, the friendship relationship is two people together looking in the same direction, traveling the same path, keeping each other company, sharing the experiences of life. And I think the best marriages often start like that and slowly end like that and managed to fuse that original love and passion into something more lasting and stable, what is essentially a form of friendship. Love is also the attraction of opposites, whereas friendship is often the compatibility of the same, of people who share common interests. You know, there was a great biological reason for this, of course. And there was a great um, experiment once which they did, with a, which I still can't get over, and I'm not sure I totally believe, but I did study it and research it, and it happens to be true, where they were, they were deciding who and what is the basis for sexual attraction. And they had a range of students, male students, line up, and have female students singly come up and look at them and decide which one just purely in terms of their own sexual charge or interest or attraction they thought was the hottest. Unbeknownst to the female students watching this line of, uh, this almost police line of, 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 of young men, they had actually uh, taken sweat glands from those young men and put them on a piece of, 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 of paper. Um, and they also were able to take DNA tests from the women who were also involved in this experiment. And they decided, they realized at the end of it, once they got all the results in, and they also showed, by the way, sorry, they also showed these, um, these little pieces of paper, these napkins to the women and asked them also to smell them. They weren't gross, they were just very, very pheromonal. And lo and behold, 
the smell and the sight thing kind of correlated. That women were definitely attracted to a particular person that they had seen based upon nothing except visual and smells. About the crudest form of sexual attraction they could do. But then they did something really interesting and they did genetic tests on everybody. And they checked the DNA and the structure of the DNA. And they found, interestingly, that the more attractive people were to one another, the more diverse their actual gene pools were. And you can see why evolutionary terms and biological terms, this makes a lot of sense. It makes a great deal of sense to diversify your gene pool as much as possible for the success of your species. And in ways that we don't fully yet understand attraction and sexual attraction, which is linked to visual signals and to pheromonal signals, seems to want to bring two opposites together. My own parents definitely proved that case. I'm sure many people have known emotional and romantic relationships where you just can't stand the other person, but you can't be without them. The human species, it turns out, is designed to have reproduce itself in ways that diversify the gene pool and so strengthen the future species' ability to withstand disease, to prevent inbreeding, and to generate a really healthy and vibrant species. But friendship, of course, is something completely other. The last thing you want to do with your friend is to have some sort of erotic or sexual thing with them. The last thing you want in a friend is to have someone utterly unlike you. If there's no drive to be with another person utterly unlike you, any sexual, emotional, genetic drive to be with that person, you don't want to be with that person. They have different interests. They have different personalities. They have different backgrounds. And sometimes those are very hard to overcome. And of course, in the classic marital relationship, you also have the fundamental difference of gender, in which a man and a woman have all the usual misunderstandings and miscommunications of gender. Love is also about power and control. Freud understood this best, I think. There is an element in uniting oneself with another human being in a romantic engagement, a romantic attachment, that involves a kind of giving in, giving up. It is an interlocking of two people in a power struggle in a way. The best sex is, of course, related to this power struggle. It isn't a calm, easy conversation. It is often an interaction of passion in which one person or another is in control. And in romantic relationships, you're also always finding people at war, struggling over their identity and their interconnectedness because they are one flesh. And that is a very hard thing to be. But in friendship, you are not one flesh. You are not fused. You are actually quite separate, quite different. There are boundaries. Emerson wrote, the soul environs itself with friends that it may enter into a grander self-acquaintance or solitude. A friend, therefore, is a sort of paradox in nature. I who alone am, I who see nothing in nature whose existence I can affirm with equal evidence to my own, behold now the semblance of my being. In all its height, variety, and curiosity, reiterated in a foreign form. So that a friend may well be reckoned the masterpiece of nature. God him as thy counterpart. Let him be to thee forever a sort of beautiful enemy, untamable, devoutly revered. I love that phrase, beautiful enemy. Because what Emerson is really trying to say is that unlike love, do not fuse with your friend. 
Stay separate because in separateness, you can only know in separateness what it is to be together, not as one, but as two. Let your friend, he said, not cease an instant to be himself. The only joy I have at his being mine is that the not mine is mine. I hate where I looked for a manly furtherance or at least a manly resistance to find a mush of concession better nettle in the side of your friend than his echo. The condition which high friendship demands is ability to do without it. That high office requires great and sublime parts. There must be very two before there can be very one. Let it be an alliance of two large, formidable natures, mutually beheld, mutually feared, before yet they recognize the deep identity which beneath these disparities unites them. For me, again, in that quote, what Emerson is really homing in on, and the most striking part of it, is the ability to do without it. Note also how different that is from love. The one thing you can say about romantic love is, to quote a recent movie, I can't quit you. You can't live without this person. You're so in love with them that being apart from them is painful. You feel incomplete. Just as when you're with them, it seems like you are fully made whole. It's a passionate relationship. Friendship is not like that. Friendship can be done without. It is a choice. It is a decision. And it requires work to maintain it and to keep it. It is not about power over one another. It is about abdicating all desire to have power over another person, cherishing their independence as you cherish your independence, and having that independence be the basis of your relationship. It is also, I think, to be truly friendship, useless. By useless, I mean it is not for anything else but itself. Romantic love is always geared towards the fusion with the other person to make you whole. It is also about procreation. It is about children. And it is about home. It is about building a home together and living with one another morning, noon, and night. It is a love that can strengthen and build family, not just your own, but your extended family. It is a contribution to society in a way, to be responsible for one other person for the rest of your lives. If you have to take care of that other person, the government doesn't have to. There's a purpose to all this, purpose of home and children and a future. But friendship? Not so much. It is, I think, in some ways, defined by its lack of purpose, by the sheer joy, useless joy you take in being with another person who is your friend, the sheer pleasure of their company, the sheer interest of their conversation, the memories that you share together, the jokes that you've told together so often that you don't hardly need to even repeat them anymore. The intimate knowledge you have of each other's quirks and faults and flaws and failures. And the honesty that can prevail in that relationship. Did you ever notice you can tell your friend things you could never tell your spouse? That in fact your friend sometimes knows more about you than your spouse? The person you confide in 
talk to. Sometimes there are difficult issues in a marriage or a love affair. Very difficult issues because if you unbalance them and you be too honest about them, you can unbalance the emotional connection that you have without risk. A friend, you don't have to worry about that. They know you already. And if you say something, it can't disrupt that friendship in the way it could disrupt a love affair. Because the friend already knows you, already knows who you are. There are very few secrets you could keep from that person. The British philosopher Michael Oakeshott put it this way. He said, the friends are not concerned with what might be made of one another, but only with the enjoyment of one another. And the condition of this enjoyment is a ready acceptance of what is and the absence of any desire to change or to improve. A friend is not somebody one trusts to behave in a certain manner, who supplies certain wants, who has certain agreeable qualities, or who holds acceptable opinions. He is somebody who engages the imagination, who excites contemplation, who provokes interest, sympathy, delight, and loyalty simply on account of the relationship entered into. One friend cannot replace another. There is all the difference in the world between the death of a friend and the retirement of one's tailor from business. The relationship of friend to friend is dramatic, not utilitarian. The tie is one of familiarity, not usefulness. It is in that sense a radically free choice to be with someone. Not to make them somebody better. Not because you want something from them. Not because you think it will do you good. Not because this other person has things to educate you about. Not because this person has interests that complement yours. But because you just get along with the person. And you share life together. And you walk through this existence, knowing that you are not alone and that another person just like you, independent, separate, and different, is nonetheless with you. Now the greatest, I think, critique of this idea of what friendship is does not come from romantic love. Romantic love is as I've tried to explain, a wonderful thing, but it is a temporary thing, and it is always a self-losing kind of thing, and it is often a perplexing and bewildering thing. It is necessary and important. It is part of what keeps our species going, and it's a critical glue for marriage and family. Without it, our culture and society would fall apart. But placing romantic love as the most important thing in your life. Placing real romance as really the most exciting experience human beings can have in their personal relations. Misses the point, I think. Misses the point of what love, broadly speaking, not romantic love, but love itself can be. And in some ways, I think friendship is a greater expression of love in the Christian sense than romantic love. This might seem a strange idea because, of course, the one thing we know about Christianity is that it's about universal love. In the Greek, it's about agape, which means the ability to love your enemy. It means Jesus' absolute injunction to love the person who persecutes you. It is his demand that we love those we do not even know. It is his demand that we love the killer at Fort Hood. It is his demand that we love Osama bin Laden. It is his demand that we love wicked people. 
and people who do us harm. It is the love that God has for all creation, which is not conditional. It is universal. And that Christian love, that agape, has often looked with suspicion upon its rivals. It has looked with suspicion upon marriage, actually. Christianity's recent infatuation with marriage and romantic love is, is, is not validated in the Gospels. Jesus, after all, broke up all the marriages of his disciples. Jesus told every married man to drop his wife and follow him and his kids. He was one of the biggest attackers of family life that we've ever seen in civilization. He rebuked his own parents in front of the temple. He never married. And he urged everybody to leave their families and follow him. He even went so far as to say, unless you hate your mother and father and brother and sister and wife and husband, you cannot follow me. That extreme form of agape also suspected friendship. Because friendship surely means I like this person more than I like that person. I like this person because he's kind of like me. I get along with him or her. But that person, ooh, I don't like that person. That person's from somewhere else. That person has different value system from me. That person I can't get along with. That's what friendship means in a way. Part of friendship means you're not friendly to others. You have a privileged human being in front of you. And as human beings, we, we find it very hard, almost impossible, to be otherwise. How do you love someone you don't know? How do I love someone who's evil? Well, these are things that Jesus answered by saying, yes, it is a divine thing. That's why I'm asking you to do it. I know it's hard, but you can. And that's what we've been traditionally told about agape, that it is not the same thing, and in fact is often different from what the Greeks called philia, which is friendship. But I think too, in fact, this is slightly wrong. That when you read the Gospels, and when you think about Jesus' message, you find that actually friendship is, is integral to what he was trying to say. That our church today and our Christian teaching obsesses and fixates upon marriage and romantic love, but in fact the Gospels themselves are far more concerned with friendship as the central Christian virtue. Think again of Jesus' famous words in John's Gospel. Probably the most famous words that Jesus has ever said. No greater love has a man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Now, how many times have you heard that phrase? How many times have we Listen to that. How many generations have heard those words and had them sort of part of the furniture of our belief, part of our cultural bric-a-brac, or for those of us who are Christians, just to, almost a reflexive knowledge that that's what Jesus was about. And yet we don't notice the one word that really stands out in that phrase which is no greater love has a man than this, so he lay down his life for his friends. He doesn't say no greater love has a man than this, so he lay down his life for humanity, which is what we think he would be saying. No, he's saying friends. And the love of those we know, because we know them, is inherently deeper and greater than our love for those we do not know. And the impossible goal of the moral life on earth is to feel that kind of love for strangers. In other words, agape really is friendship, the virtue of friendship, extended to everyone. It isn't 
in some ways the enemy of friendship. It is friendship transformed and broadened and widened. It's strange that this requires elaboration since there's a message scattered throughout the Gospels. Jesus went to many places. He embraced strangers and foreigners, the outcast and the lonely. He fully expressed the importance of charity, agape, to others. But he's also first and foremost a friend. That was Jesus' fundamental relationship to other human beings. He didn't live in a family. He was a source of great pain to his family. He chose to live in a group of 12 men and a handful of women with whom he was deeply and clearly emotionally involved. There are so many stories of his friendships in the Gospels, but we've learned the way we learn elsewhere in our culture to glide over them or to see in them a message about something else other than the relationship they illustrate. What, after all, is the meaning of the famous injunction that Jesus gave to Martha and her sister Mary? That Mary, who was sitting next to him, just being with him, whereas Martha was running around trying to fix dinner and get the place straightened out, and finally complained to Jesus and said, Mary's just sitting there doing nothing. Can't you tell her to come help me? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you fret and worry about so many things, but Mary's taken the better path. Don't take it away from her. The path was simply being there with him, a friend. And what else could the meaning of Jesus' primary commandment to love one another be if it doesn't mean to love one's friends? because he gave that order, love one another as I have loved you. Not to a crowd of strangers, not to humanity in general, but to the group of friends who are known to us as the apostles. You are my friends, he said, if you do what I command you. And what he commanded, indeed the primary thing he commanded, was to love one another. But perhaps few such stories are as revealing as his resurrection of Lazarus. We've gotten so used to this story, to its redemptive prefiguring of Jesus' own emergence from death, that we tend to forget what Lazarus and who Lazarus really was. Lazarus was Jesus' friend. He was the brother of Martha and Mary, the women whom Jesus, we are told, would peremptorily drop in on without warning, the women who, as much as anyone, appear in the Gospels as Jesus' close friends. And for Jesus, gender was not an issue. Strikingly, radically in his time, what made him different was his refusal to treat men and women as different in their ability to be his friends and his equals. He I mean, in, the, in his day, the world that he lived in was immensely patriarchal. Men spoke to men, dealt with men, women had a different sphere. Jesus cut through all of that. And his critical friends, two of his critical friends were women, Mary and Martha, and of course, Mary Magdalene. The story begins with an odd detail. Although Jesus knew that Lazarus was sick, for some reason, he didn't rush to his bedside. Both Martha and Mary reprimand him for this, coming out of Bethany to reproach him bitterly for his irresponsibility. They make an astonishing accusation, each telling Jesus in grief and anger that if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. That's kind of a harsh thing to say. They've been asking Jesus to come because Lazarus was really sick and they knew that Jesus could cure the sick, but Jesus hadn't made it there in time. And the first thing they said to him was, if you, basically they were saying, what kind of friend are you that you left us behind and this person behind when you were so busy doing your evangelical work? We're your friends. And at this, we're told Jesus, quote, said in great distress with a sigh that came straight from the heart, where have you put him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how much he loved him. 
Jesus, we must surely know, we are invited to understand that what he's about to do will transform his life. Before then, he'd only performed minor miracles, cures of blindness and leprosy, multiplication of loaves and fishes. To raise someone from the dead would surely turn him into a sensation and hasten the building resentment of his rivals in the moment of his death. So he wrestles with his fear for the future and his love for his friends. The sigh comes straight from his heart and he performs the miracle of all miracles and he performs it for friendship's sake because his friends, Martha and Mary, told him that if he didn't, it would be betrayal of their friendship. Now the evangelist who tells us the story is John, the disciple we're told whom Jesus loved. This love of Jesus for one particular man who fully and uniquely reciprocated is the other striking indication of how vital friendship was in Jesus' life and teaching. It suggests how even the preacher of agape, universal love, was in fact a practitioner of philia and a devoted one at that. John was not the supreme disciple. He wasn't. The responsibility for the church was bestowed, after all, on Peter. But John was clearly the disciple with whom Jesus was most intimate. You will remember that at the Last Supper it is John who rests his head on Jesus' breast. It is John who comes close to him when Jesus asks, who among you will betray me? And with John, Jesus' intimacy was at times of a physical intensity. If Jesus gave Peter the church, to John, he entrusted his mother. At the very moment of his death, the last thing that Jesus did as a mortal being. Dying, he said to his mother who was watching him and to John, the disciple he loved, Mother, this is now your son. John, this is now your mother. Elred of Riveau remembers the Last Supper when only John was able to ask Jesus the terrifyingly intimate question of who is who will betray him. And Peter doesn't dare and merely jogs John to ask the master. And in order to ask the question, we're told, as I said, that John rested his head on Jesus' breast. Who is it, Lord? He ventured. Elred said, to Peter he gave the keys of his kingdom. To John he revealed the secrets of his heart. Peter, therefore, was the more exalted, John the more secure. Peter was exposed to action. John was reserved for love. And this, I think, is why friendship is so critically important. Friendship is, in our world, the highest expression of love because it is most disinterested, it's most radically independent, it is a function of choice, not compulsion. It is a judgment held over time. It is a relationship of equals. And it is a relationship that is entirely devoted to its own sake. It is not for something else. It is for him. When Montaigne was asked, why are you friends with Etienne? He said, if I were forced to answer that question, I would have to say merely because it was him and because it was me. I think in that we have the beginnings of what is really virtue in our culture. We express it even now. As I said, the greatest marriages are also eventually the greatest friendships. And the greatest friendships are those that sustain us and sustain society. And our fixation on love, romantic love, on family, on community, on government, 
on all these other forms of connection have missed something that is lying right in front of us that we all know exists and that keeps us all alive and happy and productive and knowing that our lives through all the failures and all the disappointments as well as the great successes and excitements is worthwhile solely because someone else is there to be with us, someone else is there to abate the loneliness of consciousness. Thank you. I am now happy to answer any questions about what I've just talked about, um, but obviously I understand that that's uh, a subject that, that is um, maybe not of enormous interest to everybody, and so I'm happy to have questions and answer them about any topic within the normal bounds of propriety and relevance. Not that that usually uh, stops anybody. Politics, culture, religion, media, Obama, Palin, you Mr. name Sullivan, it. we have one over here. Um, so we have one line over there and one line over there. So please line up and I will, uh, I'll answer you in turn. Yes. Hello, Mr. Sullivan. Thanks yeah. for your talk. Um, I was a little troubled by your characterization of friendship as not having a purpose or that it's useless. I can see that you're describing friendship for friendship's sake and differentiating it from friendship for utility or pleasure. But it would seem that the health of our political community is utterly dependent on friendship, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, that perhaps friendship is a training for how to be more full people joining together, and the characterization of it as useless tends towards the individualistic rendering that could perhaps make us weaker as a whole. So I'm wondering how you would uh, That's a, address that. Absolutely excellent point, and I, I, I take your point. I do think that friendship is and does inculcate certain habits, such as respect for another person, understanding that other people exist, understanding they have interests and needs, um, and that habit of sociability is critical for the broader habit of, of communal living, absolutely. Um, and therefore, friendship is very useful in that sense. But it isn't useful if you go into it as the friend. It isn't friendship if you go into it for it to be useful to you. That's what I'm saying. That the actual motivation for being in a friendship is not because it'll do you good. It is simply because you love this person. You really enjoy hanging out with her or him. And it may have and does have and is an important element of bringing society together and teaching the virtues of society. But at an individual level, that's not the motivation to be in it. See that distinction? So in fact, it's, it's like you don't get married in order to help society. You get married because you love this person. You want to make babies and have a family and home with them. Um, but yes, it does have that knock-on effect, and it is important in that sense as an institution. I mean, what, what Burke or Tocqueville would understand as critical social institutions that prevent tyranny, because we have heft in our society in our civil society, and friendship is integral to that. It's not the same thing as communal living. It's not like the town hall meeting. It's not like the neighborhood, but it is critical to that. So yeah, I take your point. I just think that both are true. Thank you. Question for you here. Uh, hello. Um, hey. Howdy. Hi. Uh, something that struck me during your talk was how Words have things that don't change over time. So for instance, friendship. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you can have 900 different friends and you probably don't even know them all. It kind of waters down the meaning of the word friend. Uh, but you take friend from Aristotle to Jesus to Emerson and show how there's some things that do not change about the meaning of friendship and being a friend. And in other parts of your life, you're trying to uh, also affirm what conservative means as well. Like some people try to change what it means to be political conservative, and you were trying to say, well, there are these other aspects that have been enduring about it. I guess my question to you is, uh, um, why, do, why do you see these words as having inherent 
eternal meanings. I mean, aren't words there to be changed and morph over time? Uh, what is valuable about a word uh, that, 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 that doesn't change? Yeah, I, I, I see, I think I see the point that you're making. I think my answer to that is, is words are all we have to describe our existence as human beings. Uh, we have no other way of understanding a world and communicating that understanding to each other. And therefore, words do matter. And words matter primarily for us to understand better what it is we are experiencing. And therefore, it is very important that we don't, we don't abuse those words, then we treat them seriously, and we treat the use of those words through human history as something that can be traced and understood, and that we make distinctions important distinctions between one thing and another so that we do not mistake one thing for another. And by not mistaking one thing for another, we are able to do and make our lives make more sense and more coherence. Um, so in some way you could say, look, I'm just, I'm taking this word, and the word of course is, has in different languages. I mean, we go from philia, we go to amicitia in Latin, we go to l'amitié, in, in French, and we go to friendship in English. Um, but you can sense, I think, within all those writings and expressions of it, the same thing, the same human thing that we all kind of understand. Now, it's always muddled up in other things, and in different eras, it can mean different things. Um, but that core human experience is important. And sometimes, different cultures, of course, elevate certain concepts over others, but the human experience I believe, uh, which is why I'm not a sort of post-structuralist, is, is the same. Um, I think when I read Montaigne or when I read Aristotle, I'm reading someone I kind of understand as a human. They're writing about an experience that is, even though it is filtered through immense cultural and historical difference, there is a core that resonates with me. That's why I read these people, because they are talking about what it is to be human. Um, so that's why I cling to this word. And I cling to the word conservatism as I understand it, because it is how I understand it, <laughs> and because it has been that way in the past. And in fact, I think that those who have now seized the word conservatism to really mean religious fundamentalism um, and debt and adventurous warfare are, are abusing the word conservative. Um, that is not what it means and has meant. And clinging to the meaning of words as they have historically existed, and even if, it's, even if you're going to lose that battle, even if it's going to be redefined by the culture at large, at least you could be clear about what you meant by it. And as long as you're clear about that distinction and those meanings, then I think you, the world is less mysterious and less befuddling. And that's all we're trying to do here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Really appreciated your, your comments tonight. Um, I guess I have kind of a two-part question. The first is whether you'd agree that um, whether a relationship is like this or like this, there's something about being in person, being side by side with someone that is irreplicable and that nothing like the telephone or the internet or even letters can really replicate. And then along with that, um, your thoughts on uh, this society in which we live in, in which so many of us are forced to be sufficiently mobile to make that kind of extended deep friendship possible, yet not so mobile that we can go where we will, when we will, to maybe recover some of that with ease. Wow, those are two very good points. Um, the second one I think is really interesting because it, it is the way our culture is moving. Um, are we friends with the people on Facebook? Uh, can you be friends with 300 people, one of whom knew you in high school, um, another, whom, another whom met you at some ghastly corporate networking event? Uh, and the answer, I think, is no. Uh, the friendship inevitably, in its, in its, in its real sense, in its, in its highest sense, in the best sense, is only really available for two or three friends. I mean, I really think it's that small at that level. After that, it tends to be friends. I mean, Aristotle made the classic distinction, the tripartite distinction, of uh, friendship that is, that is useful. In other words, I'm friends with 
Joe because he's, got, he's really good at real estate and I need to buy a house. Then there's friendships that are just simply pleasurable. Uh, Sarah is so funny. She, has, she tells the greatest jokes and, um, and, I, and she cracks me up. And Aristotle says that's not really, that's, that's kind of you, you t but the friend whom you really admire and love and treat as an equal and who you want to live much of your life alongside, that's different. And that's, that's rare and it's hard and it requires work. And I would say it's probably two or three people max for your average person. Now the question of whether you need to be physically close to that person is interesting. Because in some ways, I don't know whether, the, the some friends that I've had, and they're really good friends, I don't have to see for quite a long time. And then when I see them again, it's as if time is not really, we pick up exactly where we left off. So I wouldn't want to be too, uh, too firm about this, too strict about this in a way. I think it depends on the individuals. But I do think that physical proximity is important, and I do think that the level of insane travel, distraction, the internet, all of which is slowly separating us from other human beings and interacting with them as physical beings is destroying friendship. Uh, and and, is and, and the, 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 the sheer weight of acquaintanceship, <laughs> often a virtual acquaintanceship, is taking our time up. And you need with friends to spend time with friends. You need, you need to be with them. Now, men and women have different kinds of friendships in general. I don't want to, uh, uh, and men for some reason can't be with their friend unless they're doing something at the same time. Uh, like they, they have to play golf or fish or do something, some trip, sport, something. I'm not sure quite why this is the case. I think it's partly because of homophobia, because they're terrified that if they're doing nothing, people will think they're gay. And so you, you have the bromance kind of situation. Um, I think our culture's getting a little bit better than that. My dad would only have friends in the rugby club or playing golf, and there would always be an alibi. Uh, Whereas women are more able to just, oh, we're just going to go have a cup of tea and chat. Or they're on the phone, endlessly talking to friends. The phone is interesting because the phone, it isn't like the internet. The phone really is, you hear the voice. And I think friendships can be sustained by phone, actually, as long as you spend enough time and have enough of a telephone bill to do it. Yes. Since, I did, since my questions have been touched upon by other people and I didn't want to embarrass my friend of over 50 years with whom I came, I just would like to know, um, we hear so much about parents wanting to be friends with their children, and do you think that that is possible? And then as a quick little aside, are you really friends with Chris Matthews? You know, I'm, I'm really sorry I didn't quite catch what you last said. You're saying that... Can can parents be friends with kids? With children? their children, yeah, you hear that as part Absolutely of society. Absolutely not, Okay. No. And then my last one was, are you really friends with Chris Matthews? Am I friends with Chris yeah, Matthews? With Chris. <laughs> Using your definition. N obviously not, no. Um, <laughs> um, I find the whole idea of parents being friends with their children to be ridiculous. Um, the parent-child relationship is utterly unlike friendship. It is, it is absolutely a relationship in which one person is there to guide and control the other person for their, better, for, their, for their education. That is not what a friend does for another friend. And this attempt to democratize the family into friendship is also stupid. Again, this is, this is why it matters that you actually keep these words to mean what they really mean and that you have distinctions between them. Uh, when people say, well, my friends, are, you know, they're just like my family. No, they're not. The whole point of friends is they're not your family. The, the key, key point of having a friend is you choose that friend. You don't choose your family. Uh, the family is, a much, is much more about unfreedom than freedom. Uh, 
That may be a glorious unfreedom and a, a lovely unfreedom and an important unfreedom, but it isn't about freedom. But a friendship, an act of friendship, is really sort of freedom's ultimate performance art. Because you're alone in this world, you don't have to be friends with anybody. But you can be, and when you pick that person to be friends, and if they reciprocate, um, and that's another thing that's worth pointing out here, that romantic love can be one way. You can just be obsessed with someone romantically. You cannot live without them, and that other person can be completely indifferent to you. And we've all been there. Uh, and if that's true, there is no real love. It's just your obsession with this other person. Friendship has to be reciprocated if it is to exist at all. If that person is not friends with you, you're not friends with that person. You can't impose friendship on someone. Which is why I'm trying to say that friendship is not about power in any way, it's about freedom. Which is why it is more virtuous than romantic love and more virtuous than family. We love our family out of duty and because we can't help ourselves. We love our friends because we radically choose to do so. Um, and that's very different. So I, 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 I and, and we do not have, and this is another thing that I'm kind of insistent on that other people are not, is that you do not have sex with your friends. No, 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 no. Only lesbians have sex with their friends. Sorry, that was just a... <laughs> but that always gets them screwed up as well. That's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Um, it's important to separate the erotic from the, from the platonic. Um, I guess I should say something about gay people in this because um, I've spoken about marriage and as a, as a heterosexual institution here and, um, and I do think that marriage as a heterosexual institution is different than marriage as a homosexual institution um, in, in different ways. I still think they are in their core identity is the same thing in as much as you are committing to another person emotionally, sexually and romantically to make a home together for life. And that is a profound and different thing than being someone's just friend. Um, but I do think, and this is interesting about friendship and gender really, um, that although I think it's very possible for people who are attracted to one another to be friends, a man and a woman to be friends, we've all seen when Harry met Sally, it's not always easy. The male-female friendship can always be discombobulated and uh, unbalanced by sexual desire, uh, especially if it's not mutual. And if it is mutual, then it can become marriage. But then you find, I think, at least many people that I've spoken to, and in my own experience, um, I, I'm now married, I've been married for quite a while, um, is that it, 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 uh, you learn to be friends with your spouse as well as to love them romantically. And if you don't learn how to be friends with them, your marriage will fall apart because you spend like one quintillionth of your time having sex with that person and you spend the rest of the time making breakfast, walking the dog, putting on the TV, fighting over the remote, you know. That requires friendship. Sharing your events of your life together, going over, that's what marriage is. And it's about the commitment, the dedicated commitment to stick with that person through thick and thin. Uh, and, but gay people I think, Interestingly, because for so long, for the vast majority of human existence, we have been denied and excluded from the ability to form homes together, to have families, that gay people willy-nilly had to uh, develop friendship as their primary institution because we were denied family. And of course, because we're thrown out of our own families and thrown out of the family structure, we're needing company and companionship more than most other people. And so the remarkable thing that I noticed and why this, I mean, a lot of what I said tonight came from this book, Love Undetectable, which was written uh, in memory of my best friend uh, who died. Uh, and it was an attempt to explain why when he died, no one knew what to say to me. No one knew to appreciate what I'd lost because it was, you're just a friend. It wasn't family. It wasn't your spouse. Not that I could have a spouse. 
in, in those days. And I felt utterly robbed. And I felt that this sacred relationship I'd had with them, which was not sexual at all, uh, that was a, a sense of basically of being less alone in the world with him in it, uh, was worth celebrating and understanding and, and bringing forward. That's the impulse of this talk tonight, really. We found out together, we were, we were both young, rather traditional, conservative in some ways, church-going, Catholic boys, very uh, academically gifted and studied hard and wrote, and we bumped into each other in Washington, we were the same age, and we just got along like a house on fire. And this book is really a celebration of that friendship. And then, as fate would have it, um, within three weeks of each other, we both got diagnosed with HIV. And I, he died two years later, at 31, in his mother's arms, uh, with his five friends around him and his family. Uh, and I didn't. And 15 years later, I'm still here. And I think trying to make sense of that experience and to realize that when, when the final thing happened, I mean, when, 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 when the funeral happened, uh, there were two parties to that funeral. There were his family, whom we had gotten to know, and there were his friends. And they were very separate. And but clearly, having been in some ways alienated from his family because he'd never even told them he was gay, um, the friendship network had been his primary sustenance for two years of, of sometimes unbelievable pain and mi misery and illness uh, and slow death. Uh, we were there. And that we were not his family, we were not sexually interested in him, um, we were his friends. And I wanted that to be valued. And I wanted that to be respected. And we were. And his family totally understood it. Um, and I think that many gay people over the years um, created these friendships as a way to survive in the world without family. And finally, in the last you know, couple of decades, we've begun to have the ability to have our families, our romantic love, actually celebrated and defended, and to have our homes celebrated. So in some ways, I, I worry that our friendship may wither as, uh, because the, the muscles required to use it, which were by force, by necessity, may wither and die. But I don't want to forget that. And, uh, uh, and I do want to pay tribute to that. And I do want to insist that that is not something trivial. And in fact, in human history, it was deep. Uh, and, and in some contexts, deeper than anything else. Uh, and I think within my friendship with, with Patrick, um, my faith deepened and grew. And uh, the Christianity that I thought I believed in became more real because it was expressed in friendship. And so when I, I don't see my own church or other churches or other Christian communities um, really speaking to that, which I think is a core message of the Gospels, which is why I went kind of heavily into Jesus. I hope it wasn't too cloyingly religious for people. Um, uh, that's why I did that. Because I think this connection between friendship and Christianity is, is critical to understanding Christianity. And the fact that, that almost all organized Christianity right now is obsessed with the family, and, and a very particular form of family, um, is a terrible um, misplacement of priorities in understanding what the Gospels were really trying to tell us. Why don't we have uh, one more question? Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm interested in your views on conservatism, and my question is very simple. How optimistic are you that American conservatism will come round to your understanding of conservatism? Um, I am quite optimistic in the long run because I think uh, the alternative is, uh, is too terrifying to contemplate. Because at some point, someone has to be in a, cult in a society like ours, a country like this, in a situation like this, someone has to be the actual conservative. 
Um, right now, in my view, the most actual grown-up conservative in the country at this point is Barack Obama. In as much as, uh, I know that will blow people's minds, but <laughs> let me explain why. <laughs> because, to my mind, the conservative is the person that says, we can't do that, we can't afford that, and we shouldn't try that. The conservative is always the spoil sport. He or she says, this is a dream, this is utopian fantasy. Let us balance our budget, let us fight and win wars we can fight and win, let us restrain the size of government, let us have a rational debate about what government should and shouldn't do, and let's try and make it do as little as possible, um, and let's have a, a debate based upon reality, not ideology. And I look at the last eight years of, of, of Republican rule um, and you see massive spending, huge borrowing, massive expansion of government powers over individuals, um, and two uh, wars that we don't even know if we've won or not. Uh, nation building efforts now at great expense um, in places that we, we can't even understand, let alone control. Whatever else the legacy of George W. Bush, it was not a conservative legacy. Now, the, the right wing now understands that, though they were quiet at the time. I wasn't, but they were. Um, but now, the right wing, unfortunately, even though I think in many respects it's healthy and rather encouraging that many people on the Republican right are now talking about balancing budgets and cutting borrowing and stopping spending, even though they did it themselves, they have an utterly unrealistic idea of how that can be done. If they are going to insist upon no tax increases whatsoever, when we have a $1.4 trillion annual deficit, then they're going to have to slash spending in ways that are absolutely devastating. And now, it may be that's the right thing to do, and I suspect it is, probably, at some level. But um, they're not saying that. They're not. They're not proposing a single thing to cut. They will not propose a single conservative measure to bring the budget back to balance. They are not proposing to end any wars. They're not proposing any reduction in the Pentagon's budget. They refuse to tackle Social Security in any profound way, and they have just gone on record as saying there'll be absolutely no meddling with Medicare. So they left us with um, trillions of dollars in unfunded liabilities, a $5 trillion added to the national debt after they inherited a surplus, and now we're saying we've got to cut spending, but we're not going to tell you what we're going to cut. It's not a conservatism, it's, it's, it's a form, it's a temper tantrum right now. And, uh, and someone has to come back in and be the conservative and say, can we really afford to stay in Iraq and Afghanistan for the rest of our lives? Can we really afford um, the welfare state that we've constructed in this country? Uh, uh, and what do we actually still need to do to spend money? Because you, you have to spend money to achieve certain goals. If our infrastructure is crumbling, we need to spend it on the infrastructure in order to create wealth in the future. Um, and so we need to have a sober, conservative analysis of what our priorities are. The Republican Party has none of that. They just have, in my opinion, at this point, slogans and postures, having betrayed their principles for eight years. Um, now, the Democrats are not exactly much better. Um, but I do find in the current president a sober, reasonable, grown-up attitude towards these problems and an ability to talk about them and debate them rationally. And I think that is the real conservative position at this point, which is why I'm very happy to support him. Uh, I do think that his fundamental test next year, once we get out of this recession, will be addressing the fiscal imbalance. And if he does not propose serious either tax increases or spending cuts, then I think he's not going to be a conservative either. But I do think of him, I do think of Obama as someone who is deeply conservative in the sense that, look at the, look at con the constitutional order. What he inherited was a constitutional order gone completely awry in which the presidency, the executive branch, had accrued so much powers to itself, the, the, the legislative branch was basically a rubber stamp to whatever it wanted to do. It had also decided that the presidency 
would have complete control, not only in the war, but in a war that was defined as existing also within the United States. So you had astonishing seizure of powers by the presidency under the last administration. I mean, the president actually asserted, the last president actually asserted the right of a president to seize, imprison, without charges, and torture anybody in the United States that he deemed was a threat to national security. Not an enemy soldier, but citizens without trial, uh, with no due process. Now that's an astonishing leap in power that was extremely dangerous in my opinion. Um, and what Obama has done is said, no, I renounce that power. That whatever powers we need to assume for national security are going to have to be uh, balanced between the legislature, the judiciary, and the, and the executive, especially with respect to individual American citizens and people living in America. That is an actual return to the traditional order, not a, not a, it was Bush who was the radical, not Obama. It's Obama who's saying on big issues like healthcare or the climate, it's not the president's job. It is the Congress's job to pass legislation and to negotiate and debate and to deliberate our national a solution to these problems. Not my job to be the decider. It is your job to be the deliberators and the legislators. So he's allowing the legislative process to actually take place as the Constitution said it should be. For this, he's being called weak. No, he's being called a president, as traditionally understood. And also, of course, uh, the Supreme Court and the judiciary uh, also has been unbalanced in the sense that it has, in my view, become far too deferent to the executive branch. Uh, which is why habeas corpus was able to be suspended in this country and no one really batted an eyelid. Which is why the president could unilaterally violate American law and, and the Geneva Conventions and seize people and torture them uh, under his own prerogatives, answerable to no one, and to get and pay his own hack lawyers to come up with patently phony legal defenses of it. So Obama is represents to me a resettling of the country back away from the radicalism and extremism of the Bush years. In that sense, he's conservative. And the difference also, if you want to look at the healthcare proposals, is that Obama has, whether you agree with it or not, and whether you actually think the numbers add up or not, he has at least attempted to say that what he wants to do with his health insurance reform is to have it pay for itself. He's costed it, he's shown what it will cost, he's argued that it will be paid for by Medicare, and the CBO says it will reduce the deficit. Compare it to Bush, Medicare Prescription Drug Act, five times as expensive long-term, $32 trillion added to the long-term unfunded liabilities, no way to pay for it whatsoever. No taxes raised, no other spending cut. Now, to my mind, Bush was the liberal in that sense, in the bad sense, and Obama is the conservative in the good sense. And Obama is actually in dealing with issues of war and peace, is actually taking the time to deliberate our strategy and our future in Afghanistan, including all possible options, as opposed to a president who launched an invasion of a country without any plan for the occupation, resulting in the deaths of tens of thousands of innocent civilians, thousands of American soldiers, and a trillion dollars of American taxpayers' money. Obama is the conservative. And, and that's, why I'm not, that's why I cling to this word. There's no reason why we should let dialogues distort our language. In fact, it's incredibly important that we, I mean, I'll finish on this. The most important essay I ever read, and the one essay I tell every intern who ever works for me to read before they can do a thing, is George Orwell's politics in the English language. Because what Orwell understood is when the language is abused, something is going wrong. So one of my consistent insistences over the last eight years is to call torture, torture. To demand that people see what's going on and to recognize the illegal and unconstitutional acts that were conducted by the last president. Um, instead of, and you know Orwell would have just 
the minute I heard the term enhanced interrogation techniques, <laughs> you know that something wicked is going on. When people cannot find the English language to describe the things they are doing to other human beings, when you grab a human being, you strip him of all his clothes, you, you tie him in stress positions for hours on end so that his limbs and joints are tearing out. You then freeze his cell to 38 degrees and cover him in water until he is turned into hypothermia, until he has to be hospitalized and then brought back in subsequently to be frozen again. And then you slam that person against a plywood wall and then you strap that person to a waterboard and you give him the sensation of drowning for 183 times. You are torturing people. There's no absolute, no inkling of a way you're not torturing that person. When you can actually examine the techniques that Bush used and see them used in exactly the same way by Stalin, by the Khmer Rouge, and by the Gestapo, there is no question that it's torture. If the students that have just been arrested in Iran, the American students have been charged of espionage, emerged from their captivity, and we found out that they had been stripped naked, strung from shackles until their joints were breaking and had been waterboarded, do you think anybody in this country would say they had only been subjected to enhanced interrogation techniques? The question answers itself. Words matter. Just because a religious movement in this country called what happened in the last eight years conservatism does not mean it was conservative. It is their attempt to disguise what they were doing by calling it conservative. Just as those people who stand up and scream that they are defending Christianity in this country have to be also told no. When I found that by far the biggest support for torture of human beings comes from evangelical Christians, I thought something has gone wrong with Christianity. And if these people are calling themselves Christians and defending these on Christian grounds, they have to be denied that word. They're not Christians. No Christian can do that. No Christian can defend that, period. And so words do matter. Um, friendship as a word matters, love matters. And separating those two things out is critical. The trouble with the English language is that love, this ghastly, sappy, sentimental word that has come out of the 60s to describe basically everything we do and every feeling we have has completely obliterated our ability to make distinctions about what it is that human beings feel and do. And I think fighting for language is the first sort of important uh, step in, in sustaining our freedoms. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a great pleasure.